According to Their Lights by O. Henry Retold by Mina Morris In a busy part of a big city, where many noisy and restless people live, young Murray and the captain became friends. Both of them were having a really bad time and had lost much of what they had. They were like many others who grew up in their big, proud city. The captain used to be a captain in the police, but something bad happened in the city and he lost his job. They took away his police badge and he also lost his houses, which he had to give to his lawyers. He was very down on his luck. Then he was thrown out of a bar. He got some old shoes and wrote letters to the newspapers to complain. He even fought with someone who tried to make him take a bath at a place where homeless people can sleep. When Murray first met him, he was with an Italian lady who sold apples and garlic, and he was talking about a song. Murray's problems were different, but also very bad. He used to have a lot of nice things. There is even a famous house that belonged to his family. But after a big fight in his family, he was thrown out. He had nothing left, so he ended up on the streets where he met the captain. One night, they sat on a bench in a small park downtown. The captain was very big and looked very messy. His face was red and he had a rough beard. He was wearing a floppy hat and his clothes were very dirty. He also had a belt that was too tight and his shoes had no buttons. He was talking in a deep voice about how unlucky he was. Murray was sitting next to him in old and torn clothes. He was quiet and seemed sad, like a ghost. I'm hungry, said the captain in a rough voice. I'm so hungry I could eat everything in a restaurant. Can't you think of something, Murray? You're sitting there all quiet. Think of some place where we can get some food. You forget, my dear captain, said Murray not moving, that the last time we tried to get food, it was my idea. Yes, it was, said the captain sadly. And it didn't work. Do you have any other ideas? I thought it would work, said Murray. I thought Malone would let us have free food, because we talked about baseball the last time I was there. I almost had some food, said the captain, showing his hand. I was about to take a turkey leg and some sandwiches when the waiters caught us. I was very close to the olives, said Murray. Stuffed olives. I haven't had one in a year. What should we do? asked the captain. We can't starve. Can't we? said Murray in a quiet voice. I'm glad to hear that. I thought we could. Wait here, said the captain getting up with difficulty. I'll try one more time. You stay here until I come back, Murray. I won't be there for more than half an hour. If I succeed, I'll come back with money. He tried to make himself look better. He brushed his fiery mustache, showed a pair of black-edged cuffs, tightened his belt, and walked off, looking as happy as a zoo rhinoceros across the south end of the park. After the captain was out of sight, Murray also left the park and quickly went east. He stopped at a building with two green lights at the steps. A police captain named Marini, he said to the desk officer, was let go from the force after being charged three years ago. I think they didn't punish him then. Is the police looking for this man now? Why are you asking? asked the officer with a frown. I thought there might be a reward, explained Murray easily. I know the man well. He is hiding now. I could find him any time. 
if there is a reward. There's no reward, interrupted the officer quickly. We don't want the man, and we don't want you either, so leave. You're friendly with him, and you would turn him in. Leave quickly, or I'll make you leave. Murray looked at the officer with a calm and serious expression. I would just be doing my duty as a citizen and a gentleman, he said, if I could help the police catch a lawbreaker. Murray quickly went back to the park bench. He folded his arms and huddled in his clothes, looking like a ghost. Ten minutes later, the captain came back, looking very upset. His collar was torn, his hat was damaged, his shirt was ripped open, and he was covered in some bad-smelling oily liquid that smelled like garlic and food waste. For heaven's sake, Captain, Murray said, I wouldn't have waited for you if I knew you were so desperate that you went through garbage. Stop talking, said the captain, harshly. I'm not that desperate yet. The smell is just on my clothes. I went to Essex and asked Katrina, the fruit shop owner, to marry me. I thought I could make her business better. I thought she liked me last week. But look what she did to me. I guess I was too forward. Well, that plan failed. You don't mean to say, said Murray, with a lot of disgust, that you would have married that woman to get out of your problems. Me, said the captain. I would marry the Empress of China for a bowl of food. I would kill someone for a plate of beef stew. I would steal from a poor child. I would become a Mormon for a bowl of soup. I think, said Murray, resting his head on his hands, that I would betray someone for a drink of whiskey. For thirty pieces of silver, I would. Oh, come on, shouted the captain, shocked. You wouldn't do that, Murray. I always thought that Leo telling on his boss was the worst thing that ever happened. A man who betrays his friend is worse than a pirate. A big man walked through the park, looking at the benches under the lights. Is that you, Mac? he said, stopping in front of them. His shiny pin and chain had diamonds. He was big, clean, and looked well-fed. Yes, I see it's you, he continued. They told me at Mike's that you might be here. I need to talk to you, Mac. The captain stood up quickly. If Charlie Finnegan was looking for him, it must be important. Charlie took him into a dark area. You know, Mac, he said, they're trying Inspector Pickering for taking money he shouldn't have. He was my boss, said the captain. O'Shea wants his job, Finnegan continued. He must get it. It's good for the group. Pickering must be found guilty. You need to tell the court against him. He was your boss when you were a cop. The money passed through your hands. You have to speak against him. He was. The captain started. Wait a second, said Finnegan. He took out some money. Five hundred dollars for you. Two fifty right now, and the rest. He was my friend. I tell you, the captain finished. I won't speak against Dan Pickering, who was my friend. I don't have much, but I won't betray a friend. The captain's voice was loud. Leave this park, Charlie Finnegan. Even us thieves and tramps are better than you with your dirty money. Finnegan left. The captain went back to his seat. I couldn't help hearing, said Murray, looking sad. I think you are very silly. What would you have done? asked the captain. I would have spoken against Pickering, said Murray. Sonny said the captain with a rough voice. 
You and I are different. New York is split into two parts. Above 42nd Street and below 14th. You're from the other part. We both do what we think is right. A clock showed it was almost midnight. Both men got up and left as if they had the same idea. They left the park, went through a small street, and came to Broadway, which was dark and empty. They turned north. A cop looked at them but didn't stop them. There were other people looking like them moving quickly to the same place, a place with no sign except the mark on the ground made by many waiting feet. At Ninth Street, a tall man with a fancy hat got off a bus. He saw Murray, grabbed him, and took him under a street light. The captain waited at the corner, making noises like an angry bear. Jerry! shouted the man in the hat. How lucky I was going to look for you tomorrow. Your grandpa has changed his mind. You're back in his good books. Congratulations. Come to the office tomorrow and get all the money you need. He told me to give you a lot. And the marriage plan? said Murray, turning his head. Well, um, your grandpa wants you and Miss Vanderhurst to be. Good night, said Murray, walking away. You crazy person! shouted the other man, grabbing his arm. Would you give up two million dollars because of... Did you ever see her nose, my friend? asked Murray, very seriously. But listen to me, Jerry. Miss Vanderhurst has a lot of money, and... Did you ever see her nose? Yes, I know her nose isn't. Good night, said Murray. My friend is waiting for me, I'm telling you. There is nothing going to happen. Good night. A long line of men was waiting from a door on 10th Street all the way to Broadway. They were standing on the side of the street. The captain and Murray joined the line at the end. Twenty feet longer than last night, said Murray, looking up at the church as a way to measure. Half an hour said the captain in a rough voice, before we get our bread. The clocks around the city started to strike twelve. The line of people moved slowly, their shoes making a sound like a snake hissing on the street. The people who lived in the way they thought were right joined the line at the back. The end.